Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Eliza Kelston from the American Sustainable Business Council. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, to hear our presentation from Representative Jennifer Benson from Massachusetts and Representative Sarah copeland Hansis from Vermont. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then we'll pass it over to them to do their presentations. Um, as a reminder, we do have a chat function on the webinar, so if you have questions that come up as you're listening to the presentation, please submit your questions through that function. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, um, but if you think of things as the presentation is going on, please submit them there. Um, so I will get us started. Um, so today we're talking about climate change and putting a price on carbon. You can go to the next slide. Um, as many of you know, climate change presents a very large threat to our economy and our communities. Um, specifically in New England um, is at high risk for sea level rise and continued um, warming and extreme winter storms. A recent study came out um, showing a connection between warming in the Arctic and all of the really big nor'easters that have been coming this year. Um, and that kind of prompted us to say, you know, we really need to reignite this debate about climate change and how we can take action, especially at the state level. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, many businesses are taking individual action on climate, um, but that individual action is not enough. We really need policy solutions so that we can achieve our goals of keeping warming under two degrees Celsius. Um, New England states have been leaders on taking action on climate, um, but there need to be new policies and programs to help meet those really ambitious targets that states have set. Um, we're about to hear from two champions of the Carbon Cost Coalition, a group of legislators from nine states, both in New England and the Mid-Atlantic, as well as some states on the West Coast. And that group has been supported by the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, a group that ASBC works very closely with. Um, and they have really been championing, championing market-based solutions um, for climate change in states. So we're so lucky to have two of those champions with us. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the type of proposal that they're presenting, which is a price on carbon. Um, a carbon price internalizes the cost of greenhouse gas emissions by assigning a monetary value to each ton emitted. So basically, it allows us to um, put a price on all of the negative externalities that are associated with fossil fuels and carbon. Um, carbon prices can be implemented in different ways and use our revenues for different things, as we're going to learn this afternoon. Um, but carbon prices are so effective because they're a market-based approach. You can go to the next slide. And they have three really strong benefits. The first is that it effectively reduces emissions. The second is it helps promote fair competition in the energy um, market. And the third one is that it spurs innovation and job creation. You'll see how that happens in these different state proposals, but if you're interested in learning more specifics about a carbon price, um, you can go to ASBC's website on carbon pricing, which is carbonprice.asbcouncil.org um, to learn more specifically about a carbon price. But now I'm going to hand it over to our first legislator, Representative Jennifer Benson, who is a state representative in Massachusetts and has been since 2009. She is currently the chair of the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight. Um, and in addition to that position, she sits on the National Board of Directors for Women in Government. Um, Representative Benson has filed ambitious carbon pricing legislation that has gained support from over 50 co-sponsors um, and support from leading environmental and energy and advocacy organizations like ours, as well as ones in her state of Massachusetts. So Representative Benson, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be on the call today. And um, if you wanna forward it to the next slide, we'll start getting into the details. You know, one thing I will say before I get into my bill specifically, um, putting a price on carbon and having this market-driven approach, I think, is is an excellent tool. Um, and you will see in my legislation, um, it's a revenue-positive tool that really puts money on the table to make large-scale investment. But um, I will also say there's a lot of other pieces to this puzzle, including um, grid modernization and resiliency, including energy efficiency, um, climate adaptation. There's a lot of other pieces to this puzzle that needs to be addressed, and I see um, in particular, um, modernizing our electric grid, um, energy storage solutions, I think, are an important and integral part to um, addressing um, carbon emissions in general. 
um, but as a real uh, companion piece to talking about carbon pricing. So that's just my sort of quick overview. So um, I think for my bill, House Bill 1726, it is a um, carbon pricing uh, proposal that 80% of the revenue that comes in um, due to this program would go back to consumers and employers. So what that means is every family um, would receive uh, rebates for not only the adults in the family but children as well and every business would receive um, rebates based on the number of their employees. So when you look at this and we have created um, uh, a, a rebate program that helps out um, folks based on income. So if you're in the lowest 40% um, approximately of income earners in Massachusetts, you are likely to make out ahead on this. If you're in the middle 20%, you're probably going to break even. And so we wanted to make sure that we weren't um, uh, that we were protecting the folks who are probably the most vulnerable from an economic perspective but who also um, lack funds to make real investments in carbing their, uh, curbing their energy um, usage um, and have historically been the least able to invest significant funds into that area. So we're trying to get money into the pocket of these um, specific consumers um, so that they can start making those small investments that will hopefully make a difference. Um, so I think that's really important, which is why the coalition behind my bill extends beyond the environmental community into religious organizations, social justice groups, because we're really addressing something that has, at this point in Massachusetts, and I think in most of the country, has not been addressed. So um, along those same lines, most businesses would come out even, and um, this would be a net neutral impact to them. Um, and so I think that's really important too, so that we're, especially our smaller businesses, aren't unfairly burdened by this. Uh, next slide. So the Green Infrastructure Fund, and this is really, I think, the most um, um, exciting piece of, of this bill. Because one of the areas I hear all the time in my district and around Massachusetts and in other parts of the country is how can we um, really put real dollars into large scale um, projects to reduce our carbon footprint. And so 20% of the revenue that comes in through this pricing scheme would go into a green infrastructure fund that would actually not be um, part of the overall general fund revenue for the state, but would actually be controlled by an organization that, uh, uh, that the Clean Energy Center that would um, uh, grant this money out. So it never comes through and could possibly be grabbed by other parts of, of um, the budget. And I think that's really important from a transparency and trust in the fact that we are investing these, these funds. So that 20%, which we estimate would be um, about 300 million, uh, 250 to 300 million in the first year alone, and that's based on a $20 per ton carbon price, um, could go into transportation, resiliency, efficiency projects uh, for municipalities, for regions, it could uh, regional transportation, which is uh, severely lacking in many parts of the state. And uh, I think this is a critical piece to jump-starting, uh, getting off of um, this reliance on carbon-based fuels. And uh, so every, theoretically, every school building, every town hall, every municipal structure should have um, uh, access to envelope um, improvements, lighting improvements, um, HVAC improvements. Uh, and right now there's not a lot of money that's being put toward that on a, on a large scale basis. So, so I think this is a really exciting piece. The other possibility too with this fund, um, and it's totally allowable within the, the, um, the legislation, is to look at a loan program for small businesses who would also like to say put solar um, on the roofs of 
their businesses or, or invest in energy efficiency. And so that is not out of the picture. And that is certainly something I've heard from chambers of commerce across Massachusetts. So next slide. So I think, you know, why revenue positive? And I know there's a lot of political conversations about this. Um, I think re to reiterate what I just said in the last on the last slide, um, I we have very aggressive targets um, that we're trying to meet here in Massachusetts. And my concern is to reach those 2050 targets, right now we are on track to to not um, meet the the legal requirements that we set upon ourselves. And so we have to do more. Carbon pricing in and of itself is a great tool, but to really boost the um, efficacy of establishing a price on carbon, I believe we need these larger scale um, projects. And the other great political aspect of that is cities and towns desperately need these funds and are, and are very supportive of the idea of investment. It um, the, the studies we have seen from British Columbia and other places is that it does not, it not only is it not a drag on the economy, but we believe it will be a big boon to um, transitioning folks into more green uh, uh, workplaces and uh, careers, uh, because we'll be putting real dollars into that. And when we talk to um, folks in the coastal communities here in Massachusetts who have seen devastating impacts, and I have a couple slides of photos from this, of the latest storms this winter, um, they really need funding for adaptation. And so we're putting a lot of options on the table for using these funds and ensuring that they're going to these types of projects and again, not being absorbed into the overall budget. So in my mind, um, organizations such as the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, which, which is an industry um, um, organization that tends to be fairly conservative, they've even come out publicly saying they support a revenue positive carbon price because they're hearing it from their communities and their businesses that more needs to be done and more investment needs to be done in this area. So that is a quick snapshot of my legislation. Um, if we move to the um, next couple slides in my presentation, you'll get a sense of what was happening here in Massachusetts uh, during uh, this winter and these storms. And the fact is that when we look at um, um, our exposure to climate change, Massachusetts is really going to be impacted very hard. The Cape, um, in particular, uh, rising sea levels in the Back Bay, um, the Seaport District of Boston, all have seen um, really harsh impacts already, and that will only um, in, uh, increase. So we are running out of time. And I think right now we have, we are building political will. I think Mother Nature um, through these storms has actually given us um, more, more political will from a lot of different areas um, to push a, pro a policy like this. Uh, but you know, we don't have, we don't have time. We don't have time to debate and consider um, lots of other policies, delay uh, implementation. It is critically important for us uh, right now to start getting far more aggressive, I think, in our addressing climate change. And I see my bill as a great tool um, for Massachusetts to do that, and hopefully a model for the rest of the country. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Representative Benson. Um, we really appreciate your presentation on your slides. Um, next, we're going to welcome Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis from Vermont. Um, she represents Orange County Second District in the Vermont State Legislature. Legislature. She's also a small business owner in Bradford, like many people on this call are also small business owners. Um, Representative Copeland Hansis was first elected in 2004, and she's the lead house sponsor of. H791, which is a proposal to put a price on carbon in Vermont, and um, it, the price on carbon is refunded through electricity bills. So we're going to hear a lot about the specifics of the Vermont proposal next. So Representative Sarah Copeland hands us all you. Thank you very much. Um, nice to be here with you all today. Um, 
first I want to just let you know that the uh, the plan that we have on the table right now in H791 is known as the Essex plan a, a little more on the name later um, but it's uh, I think worthwhile to understand that this came about as a collaboration between a group of policymakers and business leaders environmental activists and low-income advocates um, and uh, and it is uh, through the collaboration of all of those entities that we came upon what we think is a, a pretty unique and um, <clears throat> forward-thinking way of putting a price on carbon. Next slide. Um, so if you take a look at the next slide, uh, we are similar to Massachusetts in that we have some pretty aggressive uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction goals uh, that have been put in place over the course of the last uh, decade or more um, underneath under the administrations of three different governors, both Republican and Democrat. Um, and like Massachusetts, we are seeing that uh, that that our trend is heading uh, not down but up. Uh, and so I would agree with Representative Benson that it's time for us to start thinking about taking some, some more bold and aggressive action. Um, Vermont is doing really well with some efforts, which are important to understand as you take a look at the context here in Vermont in which we have arrived at this proposal. Um, we were the first state to create a, an electric efficiency utility, um, which has done a lot of good work with uh, homes and businesses in Vermont and electric uh, efficiency. Uh, we're part of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We've installed a lot of renewable energy. Uh, we lead the nation in, in several per capita measures on, on those on deployment of uh, renewable energy and on job creation with renewable energy. And um, through our renewable energy standard, we require that our electric utilities source more and more uh, of their power from clean renewable energy sources. We're at 55% now and required to be at 75% renewable by 2032. Um, but with all of that good work, um, we are still 4% uh, higher than we were at 1990 levels. And uh, if we're going to hit our, um, our bipartisan pollution reduction goals, we need to do something aggressive. So uh, next slide, just a, a, a quick couple of pie charts to recognize about Vermont as you all probably know Vermont is uh, small and rural. So you can see on the left that the black part of, uh, of that pie chart, the transportation part is uh, much larger than the United States average. Um, and so our carbon emissions by, in our transportation sector um, are, are a much greater percentage. But if you look at our carbon emissions in our electricity sector, they are um, very small compared to roughly one third as a, as a US average. And so um, we know how we can reduce emissions and that is by uh, finding ways to incentivize our transportation and heating sectors to uh, transition to electric. Um, and so that's why the electrification strategy in Vermont really works. Uh, next slide. Um, if you take a look at the next slide, uh, you know, metric tons of carbon by dioxide per person. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the electric generation in Vermont, we are all the way over at the at the right side of that grid or of that graph, and uh, we have very low um, per person CO2 emissions in our electric grid, um, and that's something to be proud of and something that we will capitalize on. Next slide uh, will show you that you know what what most people um, already recognize, perhaps. Um, and that is that the cost to operate a, an electric vehicle is actually much cheaper than um, an internal combustion engine, and that's at current day gasoline prices. And you know that 264 a gallon is uh, is pretty good compared to where we've been over the last few years. Uh, as the price of fossil fuels goes up, um, electricity uh, is stably priced and um, and more efficient. So. Uh, we will all be better off if we can um, transition into using electricity. Uh, next slide. This is my favorite slide uh, as a business owner uh, and as a policymaker because if you're trying to map the future and understand what your energy 
costs are going to be to your business in the future. Uh, if you are on the blue line, which is the electricity rate increases over time, uh, you have something stable and uh, predictable. If you are on the black line, uh, depending more on fossil fuels for your uh, business needs, you will be looking at volatility, very difficult to plan for, um, and also actually really bad for the environment. Um, next slide. So the Essex plan, um, Essex in this context is not a place, although um, this plan uh, would work in uh, in Chittenden County where Essex Junction is, as well as uh, in Essex County where, <laughs> where almost nobody is because that's a very quiet, sleepy corner of our state. Um, but Essex stands for Economy Strengthening Strategic Energy Exchange, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the goals of that program. So next slide. Um, there's four main goals. We want to uh, put a price on carbon, use that revenue to lower electricity bills. Um, we want to make sure that there's equity for low income and for rural Vermonters who tend to spend a greater proportion of their families and businesses dollars on heating and transportation. Uh, we want to make sure that the, um, the that we are strengthening our economy as we move into uh, carbon pricing and we also want to make sure that so a few things, uh, slides here on how we do that. Next slide. So uh, at the core of the proposal is, is the idea of this strategic energy exchange. We switch out gas and oil for low carbon electricity. Um, to encourage this, we charge fossil fuel companies for the pollution that their products are causing. And we return those dollars to Vermonters in the form of a, a lower electricity bill. Um, this discourages uh, the importation of more fossil fuels into Vermont uh, and encourages locally generated clean electricity, which we know creates jobs here in Vermont. Um, lower cost electricity will offer, offset the higher cost of fossil fuels and Vermonters will also have a financial incentive to uh, reduce their carbon pollution by uh, conser conserving uh, by efficiency and also by electrification. Um, the Essex plan is revenue neutral. Uh, every dollar that's raised in the form of the carbon price is returned to Vermont ratepayers in the form of a rebate on their electric bill. Um, and it's also a 100% investment in low carbon energy uh, because for every more dollar that Vermonters uh, spend on fossil fuels, they'll spend a dollar less on their low carbon electricity. Uh, the proposal starts low and ramps up over the course of a decade or so, uh, starts out about $5 a ton um, and maxing out at $40 a ton. And so every year, the, the, the amount that's rebated is going to grow. Um, none of the money goes back into state government or to the electric utilities. Um, it's held in escrow for ratepayers and returned to Vermonters on a monthly basis. Next slide. Um, so after the eight-year phase-in period, um, we'll see the rebates uh, lowering people's electric bills by 25 to 30 percent. Next slide. A little bit about how the rebates work. Um, there's no cross-sector subsidization in the Essex plan, so all of the money that, that uh, is raised from the business sector would be returned to the uh, to Vermont businesses, and all the money in the residential sector would be returned to residential ratepayers. And in order to make sure that that um, monthly rebate is, uh, is, is uh, helping low-income and rural folks who, as I've said, have a, a higher energy cost, um, part of that rebate will go uh, as a, a low-income adder, um, an additional rebate to low-income folks, and part of it will go to a rural adder, which is uh, you know, an, an additional rebate for folks who live in the rural parts of the state. Next slide. So Essex uh, strengthens the Vermont economy um, and it, it promotes energy independence and resilience. Um, currently, we spend about $2 billion a year in Vermont on fossil fuels as a state. Uh, every gallon of those fossil fuels are imported from uh, places around uh, the country and around the world. However, our electricity is all generated within uh, the, the Northeast region, uh, Vermont, New England, New York, and Eastern Canada. And when we shift off of fossil fuels and onto this regionally sourced electricity, we're going to be keeping more of our energy dollars circulating locally um, and encourage the good paying jobs 
that, uh, that are here at home as we generate that electricity. Next slide. So uh, just taking a look at our carbon reduction goals, the, uh, you know, Essex isn't uh, the only answer, as you can see from the yellow dotted uh, Essex forecast here. Uh, it's a rough estimate that it will get the trend moving in the right direction, but it's still not enough to help us reach our statutory goals. Um, but by providing monthly rebates on, on low carbon electricity, um, every home and, and business in Vermont will uh, will be in a better position to make those investments that we need in order to uh, continue to bend the trend. Um, it puts us on a path in the right direction, and uh, it seems like the right thing to do. So last slide, we are um, pretty proud of the idea that we've put on the table here to lower people's energy bills uh, to make sure that we are uh, welcoming low income and rural folks into the carbon free economy. Uh, we're strengthening the economy across the board as we save folks um, money on their electricity bills and we're helping to provide clean, uh, healthier air in the future. So thank you for uh, being here and happy to have questions. Great, thank you so much, Representative Copeland Hansis. Um, so now we're gonna open it up for questions. Again, if you have questions, please submit them into the chat function in the webinar, and then I will read them out. And if you have a question directed at a particular legislator, please let us know, um, or I will just pose a question to both of them generally. Um, so our first question has to do with how um, the bills were drafted. Representative Copeland Hansis, you mentioned that there was a coalition of businesses um, policymakers, environmentalists, and low-income advocates, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that process, um, how you came together to determine um, what would be best for each community and how that would function, and then Representative Benson, if you want to tell us more about how the idea for your bill came up um, and who provided input for that as well. So I'm happy to, to jump in there and talk a little bit about about it, um, you know, we we've had a few go rounds in the in the last in previous sessions uh, with concepts around carbon pricing, um, and uh, recognizing that the 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 biggest and, and most resonant pushback to putting a price on carbon really came from those low income communities and uh, and the business community, you know, concerned about what it would mean for their business bottom line. Um, the the idea of using a revenue neutral uh, kind of carbon dividend model really seemed to have the most uh, appeal structurally, uh, but but getting that money back to Vermonters in a in a quick and predictable way um, was really what led us to think about using it as an electricity rebate. Um, everybody has an electricity bill, or nearly everybody. Um, it is a quick and easy way not only to get the carbon revenue back to Vermonters, but also it incentivizes what we know we need to do, which is to electrify our heating transportation sector. Uh, the business community has been uh, very intrigued by that, uh, for one thing, because many businesses are already internally putting a price on carbon, um, but also because uh, you know businesses uh, see the predictability of their electricity bills um, and the relative unpredictability of their uh, of their fossil fuel heating and transportation bills, and so um, it has been a, a a lot of conversations across the board um, to to get people's ideas out there on the table. Great, thank you, Representative Copeland Hansis. Representative Benson, um, can you provide some insight into how your proposal was drafted and um, if there's any other input from other groups? Of, like uh, happened in Vermont. Yes, actually, we have a big coalition um, that was all in on sort of the drafting stage of this legislation um, and now are out, you know, on the doors to actively pushing this in a very grassroots uh, capacity. So, um, uh, Climate Exchange, uh, Clean Water Action, and many other groups were integral in drafting this legislation. And I will say uh, two things. One is I became interested in this a concept um, uh, several years ago, and, and there has been a Senate version of the bill filed in previous sessions. And so we kind of used that as the basis 
um, and then built off of that. And this, the Senate bill has some some differences, some significant differences. Um, in particularly, it's a revenue neutral um, uh, approach, whereas mine's a revenue positive approach. But both the um, the advocate community community was really interested in having sort of both on the table as possible vehicles. Um, and so, you know, we also incorporated things that influenced the Senate bill as well, as far as um, providing higher rebates for people in rural areas that don't have um, access to public transportation. Um, um, and then my bill created um, the um, income-based sort of rebate structure, um, and that was my idea from the outset because my concern has uh, been in the past that a lot of the efforts we have done either negatively impact or don't really help um, uh, folks living in multi-unit dwellings, for example, rental rental uh, properties, um, to make sure that they had access to um, to these funds and to these incentives. So, which is one of the reasons why, you know, we are looking at a direct to consumer rebate rather than filter, filtering it through um, their electric uh, bills or accounts. Um, you know, a lot of the folks that I was concerned about and rental communities um, uh, don't necessarily directly pay their utilities. Um, and so I thought it was important to make sure this money is getting into the hands of, of everyone. Excellent. Um, so I think your answers in both your presentations illuminate a really interesting point that's especially come up at the state level as legislators are trying to draft a lot of these proposals on dealing with climate change, which is there's a lot of really different and really good ways to address um, these kind of big issues. And I think you're illuminating kind of what's best for your states, but also pointing out that there have been some back and forth within the state as well as to how these proposals have come up. Um, and that has led to some bills failing in other states, like famously that initiative in Washington. So if you could both maybe speak to how you're building coalitions, both with um, kind of external groups, but also with legislators in the state to really um, kind of get one of these proposals over the finish line, because, you know, both of these are really robust and you've put a lot of effort into them. So I think that would be really illuminating. Well, I'll jump in there on that. Um, you, you know, we, we worked very closely with our community action groups, um, you know, being, being tied into the low income advocacy community. Um, and, you know, they were able to, to bring forward a lot of considerations and, and uh, you know, things that we might not have thought of if we were just trying to imagine what life is like as a low income Vermonter. Um, but we also have had a, a lot of meetings uh, sitting down with CEOs of different kinds of businesses across the state um, and, and making sure that we hear their perspectives and, uh, and then ask them to, uh, you know, when, once they've seen the idea and, and heard it and, and support it, to get out there and talk with uh, other folks in the business community. And I would say that at this point, you know, our coalition is growing um, as more people learn about the opportunities that are uh, available to us through this electric rebate plan. Um, there are more and more people who are, who are coming on as supporters. So, uh, we are definitely on the upswing in terms of building our coalition. Great. Thank and you. I, oh, sorry. Um, so I'll jump in, in here. We have a really interesting sort of uh, coalition uh, that might seem fairly, un, you know, these organizations may seem unrelated to one another. But um, so obviously the environmental organizations, the um, um, environmental justice, social justice groups religious organizations, um, many pastors, um, the Catholic Church, um, uh, and labor is very interested in this because they see this as increasing um, public works projects that will benefit their members as well. So that is one of the great things about having this diverse um, coalition pushing this is that each of these organizations kind of have their supporters or their um, their uh, champions in the legislature. And so that has really helped us build 
um, support from where we started when we initially filed the bill last January of 2017 to today, we are at about half of the House um, that has signed on in support of this legislation. So for something this sort of complex um, that has a revenue aspect to it, um, in one session to be, um, you know, nearing the end of session and have uh, Republicans, Democrats, half the members of the House um, voicing support for it, I think, is a real testament to the work of all of these just different organizations who are um, pushing this legislation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a question specifically about the Essex plan. Um, if electricity prices go down or electricity gets cheaper, how does this incentivize people to conserve energy where possible? Um, well, the trajectory on electricity prices um, over time will continue to grow. Um, the reduction, though, I think should help to incentivize people to uh, to transition when they need to replace something um, within their home that is currently a fossil fuel uh, heat system or uh, or one of their vehicles, that they would be incentivized to consider using uh, an electric heat pump for their home, um, electric hot water generation, um, uh, or either electric or hybrid vehicle. Uh, so, you know, they, the conservation measures, I think, are really pretty well ingrained into Vermonters with our energy, uh, our electricity efficiency utility that's been in place for many, many years. You know, we, we Vermonters tend to be a frugal folk and um, and are already accessing a lot of um, electric efficiency, and I'm sure will continue to do so. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think what we're probably looking at is um, an increase in our electricity use that will be because people are switching from the dirty fossil fuel technologies onto more electric technologies. Excellent. Um, so our next question is about um, how you're protecting your state's economies, essentially. So um, a lot of proposals at the federal level include a border adjustment tax um, to keep um, American companies competitive in a global economy. Um, so how would these state proposals deal with kind of porous borders, especially in New England. Um, do any of these proposals include a similar provision or um, do you anticipate that not being a problem for your state? So, you know, I will say that one thing with New England is all these states are very small. And so it is pretty easy to drive through nearly every New England state um, in a day. So this is always something we're concerned about. Um, and especially since you know, one of our neighboring um, states, New Hampshire, uh, which shares quite a bit of border space with us, uh, they have a very different tax structure, including no sales tax. And so this is something that, that we deal with all the time. But currently, we have a very different um, gas tax already um, from New Hampshire. Uh, and so I don't see this necessarily as a make or break. Um, we have a very different sort of economic structure. We have um, a different regulatory environment already. And so my thought is the, the businesses or the um, uh, citizens of Massachusetts who are going to move or shop or access, you know, uh, different kind of services um, because of this cost difference or whatever are doing it already. So I don't see that as a huge deal breaker here in Massachusetts. But it is one of the reasons why we are working in a coalition with our neighboring states and other states to really look at this on a regional basis, similar to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And, you know, ideally, we get far more bang for the buck if we work in larger groups of states because we're simply taking more carbon um, emissions offline. Oh, I think I have a roll call. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll end it there and um, um, I'll try to jump back on if I can. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Benson. Um, okay. Um, well, I hope great. we don't have a roll call because I'm, I'm not hearing <laughs> the bells. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Um, so we're still, we're still good. Um, yeah. Okay. 
did you want to oh. continue answering that question? Yeah, I, I can right. jump in here and, and you know, we, we I would agree with Representative Benson that, that we all have very porous borders. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that 80 cents of every dollar that we spend on fossil fuel goes right out of our state. So for for every dollar that we can uh, spend on electricity instead, it's money that we're keeping um, circulating local in this New England regional economy. Um, and Rep Benson is absolutely right that that's the porousness of our borders and, and the, the size of our states is exactly why we're all working uh, together and collaboratively across state lines um, because we recognize that while it doesn't, you know, the mechanics of how you use a, a carbon fee revenue don't really matter from state to state. The fact that we all put one in place is really the um, is the important part. So, you know, Massachusetts can can do their 80-20 split and, and use some of the, their revenue for efficiency, whereas in Vermont, you know, it works better, I think, in our context to, to think about using it to incentivize the shift um, to clean electricity. Um, either way, uh, it, it's a win for the economy because it helps people to transition away from uh, the, the volatile and polluting fossil fuels. Great. Um, so kind of off of that and specifically about Vermont, we've had a couple of questions come in about um, how um, the Vermont grid is or what sources of renewable energy are being used in Vermont that allows the grid to rely so much on renewables. And if there was increased renewable electricity usage, um, how, what projects or sources of supply would help meet that demand with this new plan? Well, we've got a number of um, a number of product uh, projects that are are going on that front. Um, of course, we have uh, Hydro Quebec as a as a big source of power in East uh, for Vermont. We also have significant wind and uh, and solar. Uh, but you know the deployment of rooftop solar and and then the different forms of uh, of energy storage, I think, is really kind of the wave of the future. So we're we're rolling out uh, ways of, of storing energy as well as ways of um, using smart grid technology to use the electricity when when we have uh, more renewably generated electricity uh, and and try to use less of it when uh, when we're at peak demand. So it's going to be a combination of the continued deployment of renewables as we have been. Um, and uh, and then use of new technologies to help us use it more efficiently throughout the days and and throughout the year. Great. Um, we have another question specifically about the Essex plan. Um, does the plan give a rebate or dividend to each consumer, um, or does it overall reduce the unit price of electricity? So the the rebates going to come um, come per electric bill um, and if you're living off the grid uh, because you produce all of your own electricity, uh, you might not be a customer of the electric utility, which would be required to return your dividend to you. Uh, in in that case, we would have to figure out the mechanics of how you do that. And likewise with people who uh, who might be renters who pay their electricity through their electric bill um, will need to figure out how you get uh, a rebate back to to those individual um, Vermonters. Um, it is a per kilowatt hour rebate, um, and they are refundable rebates for low income and rural uh, rural folks. So that if your uh, electricity bill goes below zero, um, that that would need to be refundable. Um, similar to the discussion about rebates, um, you mentioned that the money in Vermont would be held in escrow and then given back to citizens. Would that be something that is managed by a, the government or a new government agency, or would that all be managed by the utility companies? So this is another one of the aspects of the Essex plan that is really appealing because we Uh, the tax department already has 
uh, contact with the, the fossil fuel importing companies who would be paying the fee, um, and then they need to do some some fairly straightforward calculations on uh, on how much money to send out to the various electric utilities. Uh, the electric utilities obviously already send each of us a, a, a bill every month. Um, they would need to do some some software tweaks and upgrades in order to uh, you know to figure out how they how they track that rebate. Um, but then they would be using mechanisms that they already have in place in order to essentially return that money back to Vermonters. Uh, so it really is pretty elegant in terms of uh, low administrative overhead. Excellent. Um, and then, have there been any? Has there been any studies of the plan yet, and how it would work in the state? Maybe an estimate of how it could potentially raise any prices um, on gas or any um, other costs, and um, if so, any projections of, or how the projections for emissions reduction were estimated? I'm really glad that you asked that question because that gets me to the uh, kind of next steps of the process here in Vermont. Um, what we were thrilled to learn is that uh, Governor Scott's uh, Climate Action Commission um, included studying um, uh, a carbon price mechanism, um, a market-based approach to decarbonizing our, our heating and transportation sectors in, as part of their five recommendations that they brought to the legislature. And so even though Governor Scott has stepped back from that and said that he does not support a study, uh, the legislature is inclined at this point to take the recommendation of his Climate Action Commission and has actually put uh, some money in the, the budget as passed the House, and we certainly hope it will um, stay in there through the Senate's consideration in order to do this more thorough analysis of what would the impact on Vermont's economy be. So uh, we do need to have more information about uh, about how how the, the, the proposal would impact Vermont's economy, um, and we hope and expect that to come uh, in, in next within the next year or so as we um, put this study in place. Great. Um, uh, another kind of Vermont specific question. Vermont has a state that is a state that has a big agriculture community. Has there been engagement with that community and are any members of that community currently supporting the Essex plan? Uh, yes, we we definitely have um, a lot of uh, a lot of members of of the community who are stepping up and saying yes, we agree. Um, we have uh, a great endorsement from um, from Ben and Jerry's. Uh, ben and Jerry's operates the largest uh, freezer in uh, in the state of Vermont, anyway, and possibly in the region. Um, as they uh, as they manufacture and and store and then ship their um, their ice cream around the country and around the world, uh, and they have recognized that this would be a, a net gain for for them and would allow them to expand their operations here and um, you know employ more Vermonters. Excellent. Um, so. Um, I want to bring up the Carbon Cost Coalition, which I know you've been a part of supporting, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the coalition and the great work that it's doing and why you wanted to be a member. Well, definitely want to want to be a member um, of that coalition uh, for, for the reasons that we mentioned earlier on the call, which is that we all have uh, porous borders. We are, um, we are part of a whole country certainly feel it would be better overall for for everyone to put a price on carbon um, but we and and being a part of that group has has been wonderful in terms of of being able to hear the strategies that are being used in other states and and hear uh, different ways that that different state legislators are engaging with their business community engaging with their uh, low-income advocates engaging with their uh, with their environmental advocates uh, in order to create the kinds of partnerships. Uh, it's been really helpful from that standpoint. But I think it's also, um, you know, it, it's helpful as we go out to ordinary Vermonters uh, to be able to say, look, we're not doing this in a vacuum, and 
and we are looking at ways of uh, of helping uh, other states do this at the same time. Um, and you know, in a time when people are pretty unsure of whether we're going to see bold climate leadership from uh, from Washington D.C., we recognize that states need to lead. Um, and and I think it's helpful when we are collaborating uh, with each other in how to lead. Yeah. Um, so uh, your bill's been introduced in the House. I was wondering if you have kind of a prognosis of what's going to happen with the bill this session or if there's any upcoming um, hearings or any way that people can be involved or, or support the bill in the state. Absolutely. Um, so we have companion bills in the House and the Senate. Um, our House committee has taken some some testimony and had some hearings uh, enough to recommend to the Appropriations Committee that money for a study should be included in the budget. Uh, the Senate is now in possession of the budget, and so the Senate committee is taking testimony and having some hearings on on the Essex plan, on uh, on what it would do, and uh, we hope and expect that that the policy committee will also recommend inclusion of the the study money, um, and and then over the next several weeks um, we will uh, will be wrapping up our work on the budget, and uh, and certainly hope the governor will see uh, the wisdom in allowing the legislature to take the recommendation of his climate action commission and and actually you know kick the tires a little on this and see what the advantages might be for vermonters so if people want to get involved um i would love to have uh, have folks reach out to us um a lot of a lot of what we're trying to do right now is destigmatize this idea of putting a price on carbon um, and help people recognize that there is a future out there that uh that involves um, electrifying uh, many of the things that we currently use fossil fuel for and that we can uh, help Vermonters get to that place um, through putting a price on carbon. Excellent. Um, and then we just have, you know, a couple of broader questions about um, carbon pricing and further climate action. So has there been any discussion about other um, emissions that need to be dealt with maybe um, for methane or how to include kind of those other problem emissions in the future, as well as, um, you know, how this might affect the broader market for clean energy. Um, you know, there's there's certainly a lot of conversations. In fact, um, I'll give kudos to the Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson, who um, at the beginning, beginning of this legislative session uh, gave a directive to each of her policy chairs to find uh, a way within their policy area to take some action on climate, um, and so it has it has given us the opportunity to uh, to explore a lot of different um, uh, energy efficiency uh, measures that that we can be moving forward in Vermont, but also you know the concepts around sustainable agriculture and sequestration practices. Uh, you know Vermont is mostly forested. We like the fact that our forests are are sucking up the carbon dioxide um, are there ways that we can um, maximize the extent to which our soils and our uh, forests are are bringing in carbon and holding on to it uh, so there's definitely a, a lot more that we can be doing out there and um, I know that the governor's climate action commission is uh, is also making recommendations on that front Excellent. And then our, our last question that we've gotten in is about any um, support or willingness from the federal government to work with states on climate. Climate what? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm I'm seeing a lot of uh, stepping back from the uh, from the positions that the EPA under the Obama administration was taking with respect to. Uh, environmental regulation more generally, but uh, but climate in specific, um, and and it's frankly it's kind of disheartening from from the standpoint of a passionate environmentalist in a teeny tiny state, um, because uh, it would be nice if the federal government could could take this action together. But I think at this point, uh, my my sense is that the states are going to need to lead. 
Um, but as we've seen in, in other policy areas, uh, when, when the states begin to lead, sometimes the federal government decides to step in and, and, uh, and make it uniform across the board uh, because, uh, honestly, that's what makes more sense uh, for, for businesses and for interstate commerce. So if we can line up a few states and get a few states moving, maybe those are the first couple of dominoes, and then maybe we can get some action out of Washington, D.C. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Representative Copeland Hansos, for your time this afternoon, um, as well as Representative Benson, who unfortunately had to go run and, and take a roll call vote. Um, so she wasn't able to finish up with us today. Um, but I just wanted to thank everyone for joining the webinar. Um, I have uh, put up on the slide here, our, again, the our website, carbonprice.asbcouncil.org, where you can learn more specifically about carbon pricing. Um, if you have any questions, you can, sorry about that, email me at ekelson at asbcouncil.org. If you're looking to take action in Vermont or New Hampshire or any other New England state or any other state in the country on carbon pricing, please let us know, um, and we'd be happy to help you engage on that as well as help connect you to champion legislators like the two that we've heard from today. Um, if you have further questions, please let me know. We'll also be posting this webinar online. Um, so if there's information that you missed or other slides you want to share with other friends to, to help them support these plans, um, you'll be able to see all of that online. Um, and then finally, I just want to thank our great guests again, Representative Sarah copeland Hansis of Vermont and Representative Jennifer Benson from Massachusetts. Um, if you want some other ideas on ways to take action, um, look in your state and see if you also have a carbon pricing proposal that you can support, as well as encouraging your legislators to take part in the Carbon Cost Coalition um, and keep looking for those um, ways to create regional support around climate action, because as uh, Representative copeland has said, the time is really now and states are really ready to take the leap. Um, so thank you again so much for your time. We really appreciate you all joining today, um, and we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you all.